We'll leave the, leave the lights on this time to hopefully have a little better picture than we did last time. We had some funky looking stuff on the, the uh, video last time. Uh, any questions from last week? We're, we're going to try to briefly review hydroplate theory and hopefully get into some of the more serious evidences for it, against it, you know, why, why do we think it's a good theory, why do we think maybe it's a bit not that great of a theory, and all that stuff this week. All right. So, section two is all about the antediluvian world and the great flood of Noah. Antediluvian meaning before the deluge, meaning before the flood. Um, again, we as Christians have always believed, you know, for thousands of years, that that world was a lot different than the world we live in today. And we have a lot of reasons for believing that. Some of them theorized, some of them based on scientific evidence. Um, briefly, the climate, the atmosphere, biodiversity, genetics, land to sea ratio, volcano activity, earthquakes, possibly even the rotation of the earth could have been affected by Noah's flood. We'll look at a big part of that in hydroplate theory. So, if you're gonna build yourself a perfect climate, I don't think you'd build a climate like what we have on the earth at the moment. We have lots of our land surface that's desert, lots of our land surface that's a desert and yet very cold. Um, major parts of the earth that are completely unsuitable for farming, agriculture, um, basically wastelands, right? Um, when I was your age, if you're 15, I always heard the tree rings. Oh yeah, if you, if you look at fossil trees, you know, the tree rings are very consistent, so that tells us there was a very stable climate. Well, there's places in the world that have that kind of climate today, and the trees that grow there have very stable, very um, symmetrical growth rates. Um, and in fact, again, in a tropical climate, they don't have any growth rings. The trees grow at the same rate all year round, and so there are no growth rings, which is why ebony and, and those kinds of woods are so sought after in woodworking. They, they're extremely strong. Um, so, Let's look at the fossil record instead of the trees. Uh, we see a lot of reptiles in the fossil record, many of them quite large. Uh, we see other organisms many times their maximum size today. Okay, We have marine reptiles that grew to more than 50 feet in length. That is the size of a sperm whale, which is a huge mammal. All right, um, This guy is like Pleurodon. And they made them this size in some movie. I think it's Walking with the Dinosaurs. And they made this graph making fun of the movie because, like, Florodon was only this size, and here they portrayed him to be that size. And then, uh, like, a couple of months after that, they dug up a skull that was this size of like Florodon. So he was pretty big, pretty good size. You know, you, compared to him, you know, this guy, this little scuba diver over here, is just an appetizer, right? So. That's a big dinosaur, a lot larger than reptiles we have today. Here's another picture of him. Again, you're just a snack compared to, compared to this guy probably ate large fishes, things like that, compared to a blue whale, killer whale. We see large apex predators in the fossil record. And now, depending on who you ask, this is the lower estimate for the size of Megalodon shark. We've only ever found their teeth. And I think the little bone that like it sits behind their 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 skull or something, their backbones are not very calcified, so they don't fossilize real well. Um, again, their you know their skeleton is mostly cartilage, so we see lots of teeth of sharks in the fossil record, but not much else. And we see teeth of megalodon sharks for about yay big, um, six inches long or so, giant triangles, and so depending on how big you think his teeth were compared to the rest of him. You, know, you can build yourself an estimate for the um, biggest shark ever, somewhere between this guy and this guy. Much larger than the largest sharks we have today. Now, when we see extremely large apex predators like that, that tells us the climate was much, uh, or that the, uh, the life in the, in the climate was much more diverse. You have a large production base supporting a large number of primary consumers, your cows and your you know, your, your herbivores, and then those are supporting very, very large apex predators, right? Those secondary consumers, including us, all right? So this indicates to us something like a more tropical environment over a larger portion of the Earth's surface area than it is today. 
we find very large fossil ferns. This one is approximately two meters tall. We find them in the fossil record 80 meters tall. Much larger than today. Okay. We also see very large insects in the fossil record. And let's go ahead and get into this a little bit more, not, not to uh, you know, be the stuff of nightmares or whatever. But um, this particular millipede looking thing is uh, roughly seven feet long. Put him in this display. There he is. Uh, known from the upper Carboniferous period. It's a huge invertebrate, six and a half feet long, uh, about 19 inches in width. You know, the largest millipede we have today is much smaller than that. If I can get this thing to cooperate here. Here we go. Uh, let's see, we have a dragonfly here. This particular one had a wingspan of 22 inches. Um, this is another large one, 12 and a half inch wingspan, and largest ever fossil dragonfly has a wingspan of about 28 inches. So let's, let's see, my elbow, there's is 19 inches, so that's another about yay big. Now that'll be dinner, I, or make, he would make you dinner, one of the two, right? They're extremely large uh, arthropods, very large flying insect. Now, I used to be told, and, I, and even up until my college days, we scientists believed that the size of an arthropod was limited by its exoskeleton. Oh yeah, when they get to be so big, you know, their exoskeletons are really, really thick and they can't hardly move and they're just stuck there and they're just like staring at you. I can't move. And they, they just grow themselves to death or something like that, right? Um, but it's never made any sense to me because, you know, Humans don't have larger proportions of their body devoted to skeletons when they get bigger, and no other animal has that problem. And so it seemed weird that creatures with exoskeletons would have this problem. Well, some scientists figured it out uh, not too long ago and explained that their exoskeleton is a certain percentage of their body weight, no matter what size they are, and so their size is not limited by their exoskeleton. And of course, he asked the question, so why don't we have an arthropod, why don't we have spiders the size of city buses? Why don't we have extremely large arthropods? Well, we used to, we don't anymore. Turns out, it's probably because of their extremely primitive respiration systems. And you and I have some pretty fancy lungs that we use to extract oxygen from the environment. These guys, not so much. They have holes along the sides of their bodies that they, they literally pump air through their bodies to try to get oxygen um, directly diffused to their cells. It's not a very efficient system, and if you don't have a lot of oxygen in your environment, this kind of limits the size of your body. Because you can only have so many spiracles, we call them spiracles, little pipes that go through their, through their bodies, and um, they occur at the joints between the exoskeleton. You can actually see, you know, if you see a a dragonfly or a grasshopper resting, his abdomen will expand and contract, and that's what he's doing. He's pumping air like an accordion almost through his body, and trying to get oxygen to all of his cells. And if we had one this size today, he wouldn't survive. He would drown in our environment. Okay. So obviously, the environment used to be significantly different than it is today. All right. More recently. We've drilled down into amber, which is fossilized tree sap, into little air bubbles that are trapped in there, just like in Jurassic Park. But what we did this time, um, instead of cloning dinosaurs and you know ruining a perfectly good island, um, we extracted air from those bubbles and we figured out that the concentration of oxygen in that atmosphere is roughly 32% oxygen. Which again, is significantly different from today's oxygen concentration. And that also gives us a little bit of a hint about how else the atmosphere might have been different. Because today, if you take, you know, our 21% oxygen atmosphere seems pretty nice, right? Well, let's say you go, I don't know, throw a few switches in, in the control room in heaven, and you bump this up to 22% oxygen. Forest fires become seven times as intense. You burn up the world. In, in other words, if you go, you know, jacking around with this balance, it will just restore itself. You'll, you'll end up converting so much of this oxygen into CO2 by combining it with carbon in trees that it will go back to 21%. Okay, So today, the Earth's atmosphere is balanced at 21% oxygen. 
and it's going to stay that way. So if it was 32% oxygen in the past, what kind of a different, what, what was different that kept the world from exploding, you know, spontaneously combusting in that, in that environment? I don't know, maybe a higher humidity, possibly higher atmospheric pressure back then. Um, this is something we still need to be doing research on, but again, this is evidence that the atmosphere was way different back then. And uh, this is, you know, this finding, um, this was published in the New York Times, this finding really surprised scientists because they assumed that the atmosphere had, was basically the same back then as it is today because they have no reason to believe that it was different. And they have no explanation for why it would be different than the one today. We have other evidences. Um, this is a flying reptile. They put feathers on them on in this picture just because they're crazy that way. We don't actually have any evidence that he was feathered. They just like to think that he was. And they don't even think that this guy evolved into a bird. Um, they believe little chicken-looking dinosaurs evolved into birds. So don't get me started on exactly why they put feathers on this guy. They're just weird. Um, but you can see looking at him, and we, can, we know about how much his wing surface area was based upon outlines in his fossils. Okay, I think this guy was a pterodon. Uh, he has a very long neck, very large, very heavy head, and apparently was a strong flyer. We only know that because uh, apparently his diet included fish, and today organisms that fly and eat fish are incredibly strong flyers. So we theorize, okay, well that makes sense, this guy should have been a very strong flyer, yet he has a very small wing surface area compared to his body weight. So how is this guy flying? A lot of scientists are running around banging their heads on walls, can't figure it out. Um, he can't fly. You know, I mean, he's a flying reptile, but maybe he's evolving. No, obviously he's already a strong player because he eats fish. And how are you going to eat fish and be an evolving flying reptile? That doesn't make any sense. So they don't talk about it, right? Um, flying reptiles often have very small wing surface areas compared to their weights. And this has been something that perplexes evolutionists because, again, they have no reason or no evidence to, um, or no, nothing in their worldview that requires a different atmosphere back then compared to today, right? As you can see, this is a very large flying reptile, and apparently flew, flew fine. Um, if you read through much of the, of the literature, and I, I don't have a source for this in my PowerPoint, it's pretty easy to go find out though. Uh, if you read through a lot of the literature, especially when you get into the aquatic dinosaurs, the marine reptiles, Scientists are always baffled at how small their lungs are. Um, and we, let's just take this guy as a model. You know, if he has small lungs and a long neck, how much does he have to exhale and inhale to actually get any fresh air into his lungs? I mean, you understand, if you breathe through a really, really long straw, you're re-breathing the same air that you exhale, right? So that's what this guy's doing. He has to do that for, for his whole life. So if he's breathing through a really, really, really long straw all the time and he has very small, small lungs, he's not actually getting that much fresh air into his lungs. Okay. And again, this is kind of a, a mystery to secular scientists who dig these guys up and assume that the atmosphere is basically the same then as it was as it is today. And they're all like, hey, how does he survive? How does he breathe? Well, we think the atmosphere was much different back then. So, everything that's wounded in a 32% oxygen environment heals a lot faster. Your metabolism is faster. Reptiles especially, reptiles and amphibians, have ex uh, much higher metabolisms in higher oxygen concentration. Now they have lungs and circulatory systems, but they're kind of primitive compared to ours. Okay? They don't have nearly as much surface area on their lungs as we do. So if you go see a reptile at the zoo, most of them are just sitting there. You know, they don't really do much. They might blink at you. That's about it. That's about as much as you get out of reptiles, right? I still don't understand people that keep it for pets. You know, whatever, you know, knock yourself out. <laughs> but most of the time, they just sit there. I mean, I guess if you want a pet that just sits there most of the time. Um, but they have much higher metabolisms in a different oxygen concentration. Isn't it kind of interesting that, um, you know, we don't have large reptiles today. We have a few, but 
they are, they, they are oftentimes even more lethargic. Again, they have a lot of trouble getting all of their cells properly oxygenated. They have short bursts of energy, that's it. They've shot their bolt, they're done. Okay. So, if we have higher oxygen concentration, if we have a higher atmospheric pressure, that means oxygen dissolves into your blood much faster. These guys are running all over the place. Okay. In, in short, you have a perfect environment for very large reptiles, like dinosaurs. Okay. Uh, this atmosphere, theoretically, could have filtered out UV rays much more perfectly than our current atmosphere does. So we don't have any mutations building up in the genome. You have a perfect created genome, again, we're assuming, and uh, no mutations, no mutagens to speak of, nothing, nothing screwing around with your information. This world is paradise. Right. So, if we have all this that seems to indicate that the Earth was a much different place back then, what changed it? What kind of an event is, it, is possible to change that, that paradise into what we currently have? I think the best explanation for this is hydroplate theory. And we talked about, and again, I kind of did this backwards, we talked about some of the evidence for hydroplate theory before we get into exactly what hydroplate theory is. Partially because I want, to, I want to emphasize to you just how cool I think this theory is. Because it explains a lot of stuff we couldn't explain before. Right? Like frozen mammoths. <clears throat> they always call them woolly mammoths. That's really not an appropriate phrase. They're actually hairy mammoths. Okay, their hair is almost identical to camel's hair. Which is almost identical to elephant's hair. Mammoths and elephants are basically identical. Mammoths are a little bit bigger and a little bit hairier. Okay? These creatures lacked any special adaptation to cold. Any. You look at a mammoth's skin, it looks very much like elephant's skin. They don't have any oil glands, they do not have a dense undercoat. They don't even have erector muscles on their hair to fluff up their to fluff up their hair and try to catch capture more heat. Okay, you can find all the information about that um, in the link here. I consider the frozen mammoths to be the strongest evidence for hydroplate theory. Popular conception of mammoths is, oh, you know, they're Arctic creatures. They live up above the Arctic Circle. You know, they're sorting through the snow to get down to the little bits of dried vegetation material left over from the three months of the growing season they have up there. And in a cold snap in the middle of winter, the mammoths are slowly freezing to death and they're plodding along and, you know, and the wind's blowing. And they're like, why are we up here in the Arctic? Why didn't we stay down there in the tropics? What are we doing up here? And they, and they get more and more cold, they get more and more exhausted, that's what happens when you freeze to death, right? And eventually they just tip over, and they're frozen, right? That's what the secular world believes about mammoths because again, they basically believe our climate hasn't changed significantly, except for <gasps> global warming. <laughs> Don't get me started. <laughs> so, the beginning of the last ice age, you know, I, again, I only believe there was one ice age, they froze to death, the earth only just now, uh, thawing enough, eroding enough for them to, to melt and us to find them, and this is kind of ridiculous. Mammoths are larger than a typical African elephant, 10, 20% larger. These guys eat lots of food. Most of the mammoths that we find are very fat. We found one mammoth with 300 pounds of fat, and that is after all the scavengers were eating him. Okay, so these guys have lots of food to eat. And do you find that in the Arctic today? What about in the winter time in the Arctic today? And should I should I mention that there's no sunlight in the in the Arctic in the winter time? It's three months. So basically, the sun never makes it above the horizon. It's a little bit of light for about half an hour. But that's it. This is not an ideal um, situation for any animal. There are no permanent residents of the Arctic. The emperor penguins are the only ones crazy enough to be permanent residents of the Antarctic, and they're nuts. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so why are these guys? These guys are many times the size of a thing. Where are they going to find food? There's no winter sunlight if they in fact froze to death in the winter, which is the only time it gets cold enough to freeze 
in a, in an organism this size. They require many gallons of water each day. Walter Brown calculates that they would spend approximately half of their calories just warming water up from freezing to their body temperature. So eating snow is, is not a good idea if you're freezing to death. You only speed up the process of freezing to death. You're freezing your insides as well as your outsides. Yeah, not a good idea. Trunks and large ears are a huge liability in cold weather. No, duh. I mean, you complain about your nose being cold in wintertime. Imagine if it was three feet long. What if your ears were the size of textbooks? Yeah, that's going to be a serious liability in, a, whoops, in cold weather, especially extreme cold weather. Right? They lack oil glands in their skin. They don't have erector muscles to fluff up their hair. And any of us that have had long hair will tell you it is not a, a, uh, an asset in cold weather. If it gets wet, basically you've accelerated thermal loss of heat energy from your head. Right? So having long hair is a disadvantage in Arctic environments, which is why no Arctic creature has long hair. You ever seen a, a reindeer or a caribou or even a polar bear? They have thick, dense fur that's not very long. Okay. Mammoths um, also had long hair around their ankles. No scratches on their tusks. They never walked through the snow. They never dug through it. We know that for a fact. Okay. Arctic animals today have a thick layer of oil-saturated fur that is so dense that it is watertight. Polar bear swims in the water. He never gets wet. Kind of like Chuck Norris. Chuck Norris jumps in the water. He doesn't get wet. The water gets Chuck Norris, right? <laughs> Sorry. I'll behave, I promise. So, uh, elephants and mammoth both lack this essential equipment if they're going to be living in the Arctic. And, of course, that's where we find them. We find them, here's the Arctic Circle. Again, why is it there? You know, you're just walking north in Alaska and you step over the light. Oh, we're in the Arctic Circle now. Now, this is, this is a dividing line between permafrost up here, where the ground is always frozen two feet down all year, no matter what, and non-permafrost you have you know, most of the area that it actually thaws out in the summertime, right? So basically above this line you have no trees, pretty much. And we find mammoths all through this area of the world, and woolly rhinoceros as well. You we should call them hairy rhinoceros, I suppose. We have, and this is uh, the link to that particular page of Walter Brown's book, we have about 60 documented mammoth remains these are fresh remains. Not just their skeletons, not just their tusks. We're looking at um, actual fresh, you know, frozen mammoths in some, some degree of preservation there. Okay. It's going back to 1690 something. Uh, many of these seem to be buried as they stood. So they're in the riverbank and they're doing this. Um, one of the, one of the uh, captains of an expedition who explored this area, they found this mammoth in the middle of the river and they pulled him out with a chain and he was frozen solid and it took all of them to pull him out and there's like 30 men and like three dog sled teams or something like that. Anyway, they pulled this huge creature out of the, uh, the river and he's just standing there and he's so well preserved they were like, it was like this guy was going to come alive and just kill us all. <laughs> They terrified some of the men, you know, they're superstitious or whatever. Very well preserved. Frozen, buried as they stood. Uh, a lot of these, and we, again, you can go check this out. A lot of these have dirt and debris, small little pebbles and rocks, filling their esophagus, filling their lungs, stuck in their throat. A lot of them show signs of dying by suffocation. They have bruising on their skin. Okay. Death by, death by asphyxiation. They did not freeze to death. They were suffocated. Many of them died with food in their mouths. Many of them were frozen so suddenly and so cold that it stopped their stomach enzymes from working and preserved what they had for lunch. Now that's a big deal with a human being, but we're talking about a multi-ton animal here. How are you going to cool the outside of that animal 
so quickly that you cool the inside of them enough to stop those enzymes from working. Because even if you're dead, your enzymes still work, right? Unless they're really cold. You have to get those enzymes, those stomach enzymes, down to 40 degrees Fahrenheit to stop them from digesting that food. In order to replicate that, you have to push a living elephant into a negative 150 degree Fahrenheit freezer. Negative 150 degrees has never been recorded on the surface of the Earth. Even in the Antarctic, which is a little bit colder than the Arctic, for, you know, it's a little bit further away from the sun during that part of the year, right? They still have food in their mouths, they still, still have food in their stomachs. It's almost like they were walking around, minding their own business in some kind of a tropical environment, you know, just shooting the breeze, hey Phil, how's it going, how's the wife, right, you know, she got another haircut, my goodness, how many haircuts do we have to have? Hey, you know, strange weather we've been having. Oh, well, look, the sun's been blotted out. Poof! And they got buried where they stood, and they died of suffocation. Along with their entire environments. We have flared nostrils, dirt, rock, and debris in their nose, throat, and lungs. We have bruising on the skin, indicating death by asphyxiation. We find flowers and plants they were, they were eating that indicated a late summer death. Now, if you go into the Arctic in August, you'll need a coat. But it's actually kind of nice. Low humidity, clear blue sky, you know, critters running around a little bit. We've got some mosses and some grasses that grow up there. Um, but we don't have flowers that necessarily grow up there very often. These flowers and plants that they're eating today only grow in temperate climates. And, this is, and these uh, flowers that they were eating indicate they died in the summertime. In the summertime in the Arctic, you do not have temperatures anywhere close to at negative 150 degrees that would be, would be required to preserve these animals. If we look at the ivory that has come out of the region, we can estimate that approximately 5 million mammoths were buried there. In fact, remember those um, these islands right here? There are accounts of scientists who dig down, by the way, it's very difficult to dig through frozen ground. I don't know if you've ever tried that before, but I don't recommend it. Um, scientists who have dug down through here estimate that most of the island is actually made of mammoth. <laughs> what? Yeah, the New Siberian Islands, hundreds and hundreds of miles from where an elephant would live today, thousands of miles, we have an island of elephants up here in the Arctic Circle. We also find tigers, antelopes, camels, horses, reindeer, giant beavers, fox, giant bison, giant ox, mux, sheep, musk, ox, donkey, badgers, ibex, woolly rhinoceros, left. you get the idea. All kinds of birds and squirrels and pine cones and pine trees and palm trees. Not fossilized, just frozen. Some of them are a thousand feet below the surface. Some of them are two thousand feet below the surface. You've got oil companies that have drilled down through all of this muck and they hit forest everywhere that they drill. Should be oil down there, but it's frozen. And if it if it hadn't been frozen, it probably would be oil by now. But we'll get to that when we talk about the thermal depolymerization. Any human remains? None so far. None that I know of. So human re remains are not common in the fossil record. They do happen though. We'll talk don't don't get ahead of us. <laughs> we'll talk about that in the next chapter. It's almost like the whole ecosystem was buried here suddenly in late summer. Hmm. By some catastrophic event. <coughs> we have to have a temperate climate before this event. We know it for a fact. Okay? There is enough wood up in the Arctic today from this ecosystem that the folks that live up there use it for burning and building houses and all kinds of stuff. They just dig it out of the ground. They've been doing it for thousands of years. In an area where there's now permafrost, and they have never seen a living tree. Their great-great-great-grandfather has lived his whole life without ever seeing a living tree. They've been building their houses out of them and burning them as fuel for thousands of years. There's not even any forest within hundreds of miles. So, temperate climate before huge population of mammoths, something like a population of bison in America before, I don't know, somebody decided to kill them all. 
I don't know who that was. <coughs> then we have to freeze them quickly to preserve. And we want to emphasize this is not typical. Right? We only have, I don't know, three or four examples of them actually frozen that quickly. But it gives us an idea of just how, what kind of temperatures we're dealing with here. Okay. We have to freeze them quickly enough to preserve their stomach contents, something like negative 150 degrees Fahrenheit. You breathe air that cold, it will freeze your lungs from the inside. Then we have to keep them frozen for 5,000 years until the present time. Now, this is, this is my number, okay? The, the secular scientists believe that these things all died out tens of thousands of years ago. Okay? Now, if that isn't enough for you, we also find very curious small nickel iron meteorites embedded on one side of their tussocks. Hmm. Didn't hear that on Bill Nye. Mammoths are usually buried in muck, believe it or not. That is a scientific term. It is quite a mystery to science, however, because muck, sometimes thousands of feet thick, covers roughly a seventh of the globe, all of it around the Arctic. It has no mountains that it could have eroded from. Hmm. And mammoths are oftentimes buried in muck, next to muck, beneath muck, above muck. There's muck everywhere up there. It's all mucked up. <laughs> I have to play theory. Okay, so we can't explain why, what these mammoths are doing. We can't explain what their climate, well, how, to, how the climate change, we can't explain any of that without high play theory. High to play theory starts with one assumption. Okay, every theory has assumptions that it starts with. I better keep an eye on the time here, I'll just keep going. Um, every theory has assumptions. The more assumptions of the theory has, basically, the more we don't really believe that it's true. I actually play theory has one, which is pretty cool. This assumption is that there was a layer of water approximately 10 miles beneath the surface when God created the world. And if you make a couple of assumptions about exactly how God created the world, you end up having this water layer that gets trapped down there as a result of how the earth forms. Okay? This water layer is approximately three quarters of a mile thick, contained roughly half of the water currently on the earth's surface, and most of the salt along with it. Okay? Got a lot of salt in our oceans today. Um, apparently, according to hydroplay theory, most of that salt came from this water layer. Now, how do you, I mean, uh, is, is that a difficult concept for us to think about it? Okay, there's a water layer down there. How does the upper crust remain intact? Why don't we, why does the crust, I mean, rock is obviously heavier, denser than, than water is. Why doesn't it just sink down and the water up to the surface. Well, same reason why you don't sink down on a waterbed, right? You have a membrane there that is stronger than your own weight, and so you know you jump onto a waterbed and you just displace some of the water, right? Until you poke a hole in that membrane, you're good to go. Uh, a 10 mile thick layer of rock is impermeable to water. Pressure is so great you can't get water molecules through between the molecules of rock. All right. So this would have been a watertight layer. Upper layer of the Earth's crust would have been supported by 4,000 or so pillars. And these would have formed underneath the mountains. Okay, mountains are not nearly as tall back then as they are today, but we still have mountains. Okay. And of course, if you have a thicker layer of the crust, it sinks down a little bit more, and you have a pillar that's underneath that. Um, again, supporting the upper crust. We have pre-flood seas, but they are not nearly as deep as the oceans are today. Most of the ocean today is a barren wasteland. You got about 8% of the oceans um, that actually where, where there's light that gets down to the bottom, right? Continental shelves. Continental shelves make up 8% of the ocean. That is where the vast majority of living things in the ocean live. It's where all the coral reefs are, right? So if you, have, if you design a world where the seas are not nearly as deep, you end up with prime real estate all over the place, okay? So seas are not as deep, probably not as extensive, so we have roughly the same amount of land as we have water, as opposed to today where 60 to 70% of our planet is covered in water, and very deep water, I'll add. So we have more proportionality here. 
according to Isaac play theory. Water layer would have been influenced by tidal forces from the moon, so you have some friction going on here. Okay. That's pull, you know, the moon is pulling on that water layer as it goes around the earth, right? The earth is spinning on its axis, so basically twice a day, the, actually the crust is rising and falling a little bit because of tidal forces of the moon. So this frictional force is going to generate heat. You know, that heat is going to build up over time, and eventually this water is going to go super critical. This is what happens to your mom when you push your buttons for too long. I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> no, what happens is, this water, having kids like you would make anybody crazy, right? I can, I can subscribe to that. <laughs> um, Supercritical water is under too much pressure to be a liquid, and it is too hot, I'm sorry, too much pressure to be a gas, and it is too hot to be a liquid. It doesn't know what it wants to be when it grows up. When it goes supercritical, basically what it's doing on a microscopic level, it is constantly going back and forth between gas and liquid phases. And it's not very happy with the whole situation. Okay, and when it does this, it expands. This is a no bueno situation, all right? So let's, uh, I want to kind of give this an, ex an idea of what's going on here. And of course, we turn to Mythbusters for a good <laughs> example. And we'll probably have to sit through some stupid commercials about cars or something. Okay, so what they've done here is they have um, they've gotten themselves a hot water heater and they have intentionally disabled the three safety mechanisms on the hot water heater. You've got your temperature and pressure valve, you've got a, um, another uh, valve basically that will blow if there's too much pressure that builds up in the tank, and there's something that's like an automatic shot off. Anyway, there's three safeties on every hot water heater that's sold in America, and they have intentionally bypassed all three of them, and what they're doing is they're just heating this baby up, and they're heating it up, and they're heating it up, and they're heating it up, and they get her up to 300 PSI, which is approximately twice the rating of the tank, and then the pressure is building, and of course Adam's over there, oh my gosh! Like a little schoolgirl. I, I probably would be doing the same thing. I can't uh, necessarily brain flame for doing that. And all of a sudden, with no warning, kablooey. Any minute now. And we're waiting. 332 PSI. You can't possibly take much more than this. Boom! <laughs> Did you see him shake with him? Shock with him? Wait for it, wait for it, wait for it. And there's the tank coming down. Ah, <laughs> uh, that's beautiful. Beautiful. So this is a lot of force that was built up in this little 40 gallon tank, huh? Right? You wouldn't want to be in the bathroom when this thing went off. <laughs> uh, but you notice there's not a lot of things that are burned. Mostly it just kind of blew up. Okay. And this is not super critical water, but this is as close as I could get to an example of what, what exactly is going on here. So we just basically we converted all that energy into explosive force rather than extremely high heat. Right? And there's the bottom of the tank turned inside out, and you just kind of look, you see where the water is spread out all over the place? That's pretty cool. Okay, they do a better one here. Let me see. They do the same thing with like a bigger house. Yeah, here we go. <laughs> So they built like a two-story house and they have the hot water heater down in the basement. There you are. They have like center blocks. <laughs> and there it is. <laughs> it's, the, it's the scaffolding. It went through this floor, right in front of this guy's couch. Took the, took the roof of the building off of the um, wall supports there. Crashed down onto the scaffolding. 
Uh, you can see it's through the roof deck, through the shingles, the tar paper, the trusses, the, I'm sorry, the trusses are down here, the uh, rafters. Yeah. There's a lot of force that was involved here. It cracked, they had <laughs> down here. <laughs> Down here, they have a bunch of cinder blocks that are supporting it, cracked all those blocks. A lot of force going on in 40 gallons of water that was not even super critical, right? And they love their slow mo. And we all love it with them. <laughs> <laughs> they have a little dummy sitting there. <laughs> Lots of water going shooting in every direction, right? Oh, that's beautiful. <laughs> beautiful. Okay, so when this explosion took place, you have all this steam that just goes every which direction, right? We have the hot water heater that gets shot up into you know the stratosphere somewhere. But very, very quickly this stuff cools down and you know exactly what happens when steam cools down, it becomes water. Okay? So basically, this whole area gets flooded. Interesting. Very interesting, Mr. Kyra. You say that's what happened on the Earth? Pretty much. Now, this is not supercritical water. Kind of gives you an idea of what's going on here. We have lots of kinetic energy. That's my point. We're, we're not generating a lot of heat energy. We're generating a lot of kinetic energy. Explosions. Okay. We have lots of steam, lots of debris flying around. We don't have the entire Earth melting or other problems. You know, um, for a while there were young earth creationists that proposed catastrophic plate tectonics. Oh yeah, Noah's flood kind of probably did all kinds of things like really accelerate the continental drift. Yeah, if you start doing that, you get enough heat to melt all the entire Earth's crust. Okay, that, I, I, I've never been a fan of plate tectonics anyway. We'll, we'll talk about why that is in just a few slides here. Um, so that's another reason why I like this theory. We're getting kinetic energy, we're blowing everything up, we're not melting it, we're not melting the Earth's crust, you know. We're melting some of it, but not all of it. So, if we have this water layer, it's going through this tidal friction, you know, it's heated by radioactive decay in the core, blah, blah, blah. Eventually it goes super, crit super critical, it expands. But where's it gonna expand to? Is it gonna compress the core, or is it gonna stretch out the top layer? Well, it's gonna stretch out that top layer, which is a problem. Because you can't stretch rock. I don't know if you've ever tried. When I was when I was um, the fir my first day on the masonry crew, they uh, they tried to go get me to find a, a brick stretcher. Right? The foreman the foreman went off and do something else, and one of the masons was like, "Hey, hey, go find me a brick stretcher. It's in that trailer over there." I was like, "Yeah, I'll get right on that." Wow, you think I just fell off the turnip truck yesterday? That was a week ago. So now anyway, I know you can't stretch brick. You can't stretch rock. It doesn't it doesn't work that way. Okay, you cannot be stretched. So, when this water went super critical, the weakest point in the Earth's crust, the top layer of the Earth's crust, cracked. Oopsie. Probably beneath the ocean somewhere, the pre-flood ocean, because that's, I mean, that would be where the crust would be thinnest. <coughs> so it makes sense to me, that's where it would crack. Once that crack forms, all hell breaks loose, literally. This energy propels water and chunks of debris high enough to get it into space. I believe that this event peppered the moon and Venus and Mercury with asteroids. I believe this is where comets came from. Comets in our solar system cannot possibly last more than 10,000 years. And a whole bunch of psychologists say, oh, they come from the Oort cloud, which is We'll get to that in astrophysics. I think that's ridiculous. I think they came from this event. I think that's where comets come from. We see lots of comets. Actually, we saw one just last week um, that crashed into the sun. Didn't quite make it. It melted before it got there. So sad. But um, we saw a comet just last week that uh, the sun grazers, right? He goes in and you know we can see him in a little tiny flash because he didn't quite make it to the sun. We see comets getting blown up all the time in the solar system. Um, they don't last very long. They're very small. They're 40 or 50 percent ice. Every time they get close to the sun, they get blown up. They Jupiter's gravity tears them apart. There's all kinds of stuff that happens to them. Okay. So I think this is where comets came from. Right? Uh, now, once this crack forms, it spreads in both directions at a bajillion miles an hour. 
and the sides would crack, erode, and collapse very quickly. You can't have a cliff of rock 10 miles tall. It does not work. The bottom of the cliff is under so much pressure that it crumbles. Okay. So this cliff is falling apart, it's being eroded, it's got all this kinetic energy just blasting it up into the atmosphere. It's a bad, bad day. We have a huge canyon form in just a few days. So this is a pretty crude illustration, but kind of gives you an idea of what we're talking about. So we have the subterranean water layer. We have the crustal plates on either side. All right. We have the bounds of the Great Deep just broke open. Okay. And we are jetting material up into space at the moment. Lots of water, lots of rock and debris and mud and junk. Okay, a little bit of iron and nickel from the plates as well. Now, near this crack, you're going to incinerate everything. Further away, you are going to have rain like you have never seen before. All right, we're talking rivers of water falling from the sky. It would very quickly flood these areas. Now, further away than that, you have this water that just went through an extremely, you know, very high above the Earth's surface, very cold temperatures, interplanetary space is roughly 2 Kelvin. That's negative 271.15 degrees Celsius. It's pretty cold. And you have super cold hail that falls farthest away from this crack. This hail is cold enough and thick enough that when the floodwaters get there later, they do not completely melt through it. And in the Arctic regions, it is preserved to this day. I believe that's where the muck came, comes from. The muck was eroded from the sides of these cliffs and deposited up around the North Pole and other places in the world that it has since eroded from. Okay? So that's the first stage. Okay, this is what I just said. Organisms are buried so quickly and so deeply, we would predict from this model that we would fossilize even soft-bodied organisms in this event. We'll talk about that when we get to fossil record. Rivers of water are falling from the sky. We're destroying all of the pre-flood mountains. The Garden of Eden is not on the earth anymore. It is gone. Uh, we had crazy Christians thinking uh, that the pyramids predate the flood. Nothing predates the flood. God says the earth is destroyed in, in the flood, and he's not kidding about that. Okay? Destroyed all the pre-flood mountains. We have more energetic particles flying farther, higher, up through the atmosphere. These altitudes they freeze in a super cold hailstorm, even a roofer wouldn't be appreciative of. <laughs> Some of this material was even ejected into space, colliding with our moon, colliding with Venus, colliding with Mercury, probably Mars as well. You get further out in the solar system, I think it's probably the, the effects of this are, are minimal. Okay. So this material buried the mammoths as they stood. They were eating lunch, minding their own business. When they look up at the sky, uh, poof! They get buried in thousands of feet of negative 150 degree hail from hell. They buried the mammoths. They buried their environment. They buried them in upright positions. Froze them after it suffocated them. And of course, if you know anything about drag, you would say, well, the denser particles are going to get there first. Well, that would be the iron nickel meteorites, very small ones, that peppered their tusks. So cold and so thick, it withstands the floodwaters that come afterwards. After the flood, the polar regions face a whole different weather pattern. Maintain a temperature that keeps these creatures frozen for 5,000 years. So we can explain frozen mammoths with the high plate theory. But let's back up and kind of go over a couple of these phases. Phase one, we have the cracks and phillips in the crust with the diagram we just saw. Fountains of the great deep burst open, rivers of water fall from the sky, crack widens in a matter of hours. The water uh, jets into the atmosphere, takes a lot of junk with it. And what it's doing is it's taking a layer that was like this, and it's taking this material and depositing it on top of that material, and plates are thickening up even as they are being flooded. Okay? We have significant material that's launched into space. We have the gash in the earth that's opening up. We have millions of tons of rock 
removed from that area and deposited elsewhere. This relieves the rock layer underneath the water layer and it bulges up. We believe that this bulge is today the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. This ridge would have risen many miles, causing the place to fall downhill. Okay, and I'm going to show you a diagram of this in just a second. And again, we're not generating lots of heat here. We're generating some, but we're not generating enough to like melt the whole Earth's crust and stuff. Um, so they fall downhill, and according to Walter Brown, the crustal plates could have reached speeds of 45 miles per hour. So this is basically what we're saying here, okay? So after we've removed a significant amount of material here, this area has just had millions of tons of rock removed from it, and that rock has been deposited elsewhere on it. So these plates are now heavier, thicker than they once were, and they're pushing down on either side, and this is bulging up. And it rises, okay, and then these plates start to move apart as they fall downhill from the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. All right. As the water layer is depleted, the plate, the top plate, crashes into the bottom plate. Did you guys ever try to push a layer of Play-Doh across a table? I don't recommend it. But if you do, it'll kind of go, it'll thicken up. That's exactly what happened to the, to the upper plate. It crashes into the bottom plate and it just rolls up like a, like a layer of Play-Doh. Okay, so we would expect there to be severe fracturing of the granite down there, and theoretically, if we ever drilled really deep into the Earth's crust, we should be able to find severely fractured granite. We've never drilled that deep into the Earth's crust, crust except once. We'll talk about that in just a second. So, the heat and pressure generated melt portions of the Earth's crust, creating channels for magma to flow through. Again, we do create some magma here. It does melt part of the Earth's crust, and we're talking about every volcano that has ever erupted erupts in Noah's flood. If you look at the fossil record, and you look at the bottom of it, and you look at the top of it, and you say, okay, if this was all laid down in Noah's flood, look at all this volcanic activity we are talking about. Unbelievable. But I mean, Mount St. Helens look like um, a firecracker. Okay. Hundreds of times the rate of volcan volcanic activity that we see today. As the plates thicken, however, the mountains reappear out of them. Water rushes off these plates, and much of it is trapped on the plates. So we have major lakes that are formed on top of the plates, probably among them the lakes that would eventually form the Grand Canyon. Maybe we'll talk about that in the future. The continents come to rest. They are significantly higher than they are now. So they're so thick, they're heavy, and they settle over time. On, to, on this um, kind of semi-plastic lower layer. Um, and so at, right after the flood, you have very high continents, very deep oceans, very warm oceans. All this heat energy is still kind of leaking out into them. And you have the absolute perfect conditions for an ice age. You see, and that's a problem for the secular guys. Because if you, get, if you start an ice age going, it, does, it kind of peters out. Right? Because there's not enough warmth in the, in the oceans and everything to drive a lot of precipitation, which is what you need to build up more snow. Right after the flood, you have a very warm ocean, a very, very warm ocean, uh, and you still have heat energy leaking into it. You have very high continents. You have a lot of volcanic ash in the atmosphere that's blocking out solar energy. So the atmosphere itself is very cold. And basically, you're going to get yourself a giant snowball uh, real quick. Okay. So there was an ice age, there was only one. It was right after the was flood, probably lasted about 500 years or so. Didn't cover the whole earth. But the glaciers advanced and retreated and advanced again. That's why we see multiple little um, uh, debris piles left behind by them. It's not because there were multiple ice ages, but just because of cycles in the Earth's weather, according to Heisblade theory. So this is the final stage. We have, before the flood, shallow oceans and short mountains. After the flood, tall, tall mountains, deep oceans. Okay. 
again, if we drill and this, and you don't understand this much um, on the on the chart here represents several miles in real life. If we were ever to drill deep enough down in here, we ought to be able to find all these cracks, all these fractures in the Earth's crust. We ought to be able to find highly concentrated salt water. It's a prediction we would make that there should be salt water trapped, especially underneath major mountain ranges. Okay. Uh, we don't have nearly as much rainfall as before. The ocean's finally cooling off a bit. Um, the water layer is becoming depleted, so and um, significantly less rainfall than before, but still a very high precipitation rate compared to the current precipitation rate. We have high continents, hot oceans, lots of volcanic ash. Sea level is much lower. You have lots of water trapped on the continents. You have high continents, you have deeper oceans, and you can walk from here to Tunisia. You can walk from here to Australia. No problem if you got a good pair of walking shoes. Americans are connected to Asia via land bridge. Uh, it's been scientifically proven that Native Americans are genetically related most closely to the Chinese, to Asian peoples. Okay. Now, it behooves us to compare plate te tectonics to high plate tectonics. This is the only alternative. Plate tectonics is what most secular scientists believe. I have some serious problems with plate tectonics, and most people that I talk to about plate tectonics think it's the most ridiculous thing they've ever heard of. But it's one of those things that you don't know unless somebody explains it to you. So we're gonna, I'm going to talk about plate tectonics here, and you're just going to laugh about how you ever thought this was a very serious theory. Okay. Mainstream science ignores these problems. They ignore dozens of problems. We will run into this every week in this class. All the stuff that mainstream science ignores because it doesn't fit their worldview. Okay. They don't have an alternative. They have to believe plate tectonics. It has to work. It's the only theory that gives them the millions of years that they are committed to. So, I want to show you some pictures that you've seen a thousand times before about subduction zones, right? Well, here we have, you know, the upper lithosphere and the asthenosphere. And oh, by the way, this part of the Earth's crust is mostly solid, it's not actually molten. And we have the oceanic crust here, and we have the continental crust here. And you can see the continental crust is a little bit thicker than the oceanic crust. Actually, it's like 40 times thicker. You know, semantics. Uh, and the, um, the light is here moving that way, and it gets forced underneath this plate over here, and so it eventually melts. That's where volcanoes come from. Um, <clears throat> teacher, I, I have a question. Um, you understand if you melt it down here, okay, it's molten, it has to melt through the whole continental crust in order to get to the surface. It's a problem with trying to melt something with a molten of itself, right? Have you ever tried to melt through a layer of glass with molten glass? Have you ever tried to melt through solid lead with molten lead? <coughs> it's not so easy. It's, it's actually quite difficult because it's cooling off as it's melting through that material. So how much magma do you actually have to have to melt through a continental plate. Because continental plates can be 40 miles thick in some places, maybe even thicker. And sometimes these subduction zones go down 100 miles or more into the Earth's crust. How do you get enough magma to melt through? How much magma does it, does it take? Well, you can do some calculations. By the time you get enough magma to melt all the way through the Earth's crust, you've got a volume of magma roughly twice the size of the Earth. I call that a little bit of something I call a problem. Okay. Besides the fact that rock does not behave like this. Hello? This is a solid something. You know, rock that's way down here behaves in some funny ways. Okay, it's under so much pressure, it kind of we call it plastic rock. Okay, kind of like a solid, it's kind of like a liquid, it behaves kind of like both, neither. The rock nearer to the surface does not do this. Okay. You can't make pretzels out of rock. It does not do this curvy thing. This is impossible. We talked about it's impossible to stretch rock. It's impossible to uh, 
bend it as well. And by the way, where are you getting all this force? Do you have any idea how difficult it would be to push a section of rock five miles thick and hundreds of miles wide through another section of rock that is mostly solid? Ever tried digging a hole? Well, you understand it takes some work. You ever tried digging holes in Nichols Hills? They have something like the densest dirt ever. I don't know what it is. They paid more for it. I, you got me. But it is black clay. It is incredibly dense. And I've dug through probably hundreds of feet of that stuff. And I don't care if I never have to do that again. That's some serious work. How are you getting this force to push this five mile thick shovel, hundreds of miles wide? You're going to shove it down into the Earth's crust a hundred miles? What kind of force would be, is that even, can this, can this rock even withstand that kind of force? I don't think it can. I, I am not a believer. Now, so, is that, so I would, I claim, I claim that subduction zones are physically impossible. Pushing a five mile thick rock shovel hundreds of miles wide, several hundred miles in some cases, subduction zones apparently go that far because earthquakes, we can record earthquakes down there. I think that's impossible. This is not plastic rock. It behaves like solid. It's near the surface. So if it were being subducted, we should see this long sloping plane to the subduction zone, shouldn't we? That's not what we see. We see level ocean and then whoosh, trench. That's what we see. The mechanism for the motion, where you get the energy to move this thing in the first place, is extremely problematic. This is a diagram like what my professor showed me in Earth Science. Oh well, yes, boys and girls, you see, we have sea floor spreading. That's what pushes this humongous plate of rock across the freaking ocean and subducts it underneath that one. Yeah, right. Um, by the way, this part of the ocean they actually got right is mostly level. This part of the ocean they did not get right. That's what we should find. We should find an angle from this point to this point. Pretty much straight. Okay? And so according to that, we have rising magma here, pushing these plates apart, and that causes subduction on the other side. Okay? They have this fancy little convection current. That's where they get their energy. From rising magma that pushes the plates across and then you know the magma cools and it sinks down here well there's a problem with that idea for one thing i i, I think i'll have a, I'll, I'll just go ahead and say i have a very difficult time believing you are going to exert enough force on this thing to subduct it i got serious problems with that i do not believe that it's possible okay second of all when you um if, if this was possible, if you could have magma cool and cause it to sink, you know what happens to it? Well, it encounters areas of much higher pressure deeper in the earth. The pressure is so great that you actually compress the liquid. <laughs> it's very difficult to, to compress a liquid. Once you start getting under 100 miles of the earth's surface, and it gets real easy to compress a liquid. And when you compress a liquid, what do you do to it? Well, you increase its density. So what does it do? It sinks faster, and it gets under more pressure, and you compress it some more, and it sinks faster. You, you're not going to get this physically impossible to get a convection current going in, in the mantle of the Earth, even if it would provide you enough force to subduct a freaking oceanic plate, which I do not believe. I think that's the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard of. The other part of this, of this diagram is it does not match what we actually see. This is an artist's impression, right? Oh, yes, it's melting through the continental crust. Poppycock. This is what we actually see. This is a scientific measurement of what's actually going on in the Pacific Ocean around the biggest trench ever, the Marianas Trench, seven miles deep. <laughs> If there's subduction going on anywhere in the world, it ought to be going on here. Now, do you see this nice, neat little line, a nice, neat angle going from this point to this point in this picture? <laughs> um, I don't think so. 
So this is Guam, this is the line that this um, cross section was taken from. And there's the Marianas Trench. Does that look like a subduction zone to you? Uh, no, doesn't. Well, there's a 3D model of it. Does that look more like a subduction zone? No, it looks like a giant, it looks like a canyon, seven miles underneath the surface of the earth. Hmm. In 3D. In 3D. <laughs> Should have brought some glasses for you guys. But you get, you get my point. I've got some serious problems with plate tectonics. I think it's ridiculous. I don't know why any scientist believes in it, except that they don't have a choice. When you, when you start pointing out a little, few little problems with everyone's like, okay, yeah, that's ridiculous. Hydroplate theory is way better. Hydroplate theory is not perfect. Most Christians have never heard of it. Very few scientists are working with it. It's not like plate tectonics where you have thousands of scientists working on it every day. They're all very committed to supporting it. The media is on their side. It's not like that. I intend to, I intend to change that in my lifetime, if at all, power, if at all possible. So anyway, when we're looking at theories, we want two things from a theory. First of all, we want as few assumptions as possible. That's always good. With hydroplane theory, we have one. That's as few as possible, unless you have zero. You, know, you have to have some assumptions, right? We also want theories that have great explanatory power. Well, we can explain quite a bit with hydroplane theory. We can explain climate change. We can explain frozen mammoths. We can explain comet impacts on the moon. We can explain the origin of comets. We can, we can explain all kinds of stuff. Okay. Now, for example, uh, when gravity was proposed, everyone loved it because it explained lots of phenomena. <coughs> this explains what holds the moon in orbit. It explains why apples fall from trees. That's pretty diverse. Okay. Now, we also want to be able to make predictions with our theories. Again, using gravity as an example, we can predict what something will weigh on the moon just by knowing its mass here on Earth, right? We know something's mass, I can tell you how, how much it weighs, how much gravity affects it anywhere in the, in the universe, right? So we can make predictions with gravity. We make predictions with gravity all the time. We fly spaceships around, and most of the time we do pretty good with it. And whenever we fail, it's because of our, it's our own fault, it's not because gravity has problems, right? So we want to be able to make predictions from our theories. So we, want, so we really we want two things. We want, obviously, we want as few assumptions as possible. We want a lot of explanatory power. We want to be able to make predictions from our theory. And that's where the rubber really meets the road. Okay, sure, you can explain all this stuff that's already happened, but can you predict the future with your science? Well, we made some predictions with Hydroplate theory. Uh, first of all, again, it explains all this stuff. It explains muck. It explains the drastic change in climate in the atmosphere. It explains the extinction of many animals that are no longer suited for our current climate. They can't breathe, they can't fly, whatever. It explains why there are more craters on one side of our moon than the other. It explains the origin of comets. We've talked about the fact that the current comet population will all be gone in as little as 10,000 years. So we have some pretty diverse explanatory power here. We're explaining the heavens, we're explaining the earth, we're explaining underneath the earth. This is a very comprehensive theory. Okay. And by the way, this is the near side and the far side of the moon. Scientists, oh yeah, well you see the earth shields the one side of the moon and so there's not as many comets that would impacts as there are on this side as there are on that side because the Earth shields this side. Well, if you do a little bit of math, you can actually figure out how much of this side of the moon is actually shielded by the Earth. There's actually a significant amount of difference between here and the moon. I don't know if you've ever been there, but it's a long ways. You can actually take all of the other major planets of the solar system and fit them in between here and the moon. I don't recommend that you try that, but you could physically, there's enough space to get them in between here and the moon. There's a long ways out there. So by the time you get out here and you figure out how much of the moon the Earth actually shades, it's, it's pathetic. It's very small. It's less, way less than 1%. So scientists are like, ah, well, how do we explain this, man? Oh, oh, here we go. Uh, some scientists think that the moon, the Earth's gravity actually accelerates stuff that hits this side of the moon, and 
And so, you know, I have now, I've made the boils up this, the, beneath the surface. Yeah. It's ridiculous. Now, there's more impacts on that side of the moon than this side of the moon, because when all that junk got busted up into the atmosphere, and it came back down, it smashed into the back side of the moon more than it did the front side. That's my theory. That's hydroplate theory. Okay. Now, if that's not enough for you, uh, we seem to find that other objects in the solar system have more and deeper comet impact, or I, say, I keep saying comets, meteor impact on one side than the other. In fact, Mercury has a huge meteor impact on this side of the planet, um, and some scientists actually think that it, the impact on this side formed what they call chaotic terrain. On the other side of it, there's a picture of the chaotic terrain. It's all wrinkled up and stuff. This definitely has more craters and bigger craters on one side of it than the other. This is one of the largest impact craters in the solar system. It is 900 miles across. Okay. So what is that? Halfway across the United States-ish, depending on how you're measuring it. Uh, it's ringed by a system of mountains up to a, over a mile high. This is a serious impact. Okay, there's definitely more impacts on this side of Mercury than there are on the other side, and mainstream scientists are kind of baffled by that, because there should be the same number on all sides. Right? If it's been there billions of years getting blasted with material from space all this time, it should have a uniform density of crater impacts all over its entire surface, and it doesn't. I, I couldn't find a lot of data on Venus. Apparently, the atmosphere in Venus is so corrosive rain sulfuric acid in some places, um, that we don't actually see that many craters on Venus. It does have craters, but it doesn't seem to be a difference on one side or the other. I couldn't find much data on that. I'll have to keep looking into it. All right, so what are some predictions we can make from hydroplane theory? We predicted that deep in the Earth's crust, we would find fractured granite and highly concentrated salt water. We're going to talk about this and we'll be done. And I, and I will mispronounce this, or misspell this, so. I don't actually know the name of the place. I know it's called the Super Deep Borehole. It's Cola. Cola Super Deep Borehole. There's a tower there now. It's the deepest hole in the world. Soviets didn't have anything better to do, they decided to drill down into the... By the way, before, before this record was set, the deepest hole in the world was actually in Oklahoma. <laughs> Dug for oil, but anyway. Um, basically, they decided to drill as deep as possible into the Earth's crust. They started drilling in the 24th of May, 1970, using that thing, and they were drilling rigs, and a number of boreholes were drilled, ranging from a central hole. The deepest hole reached 40,000 feet and is in 1989, two years after I was born, and it is still the deepest artificial point on the Earth. They didn't get nearly as deep as they wanted to, though. Deepest porthole in the world for decades was also the longest porthole in terms of measured depth, and until that thing went in, blah, 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 they, so the uh, Soviets got usurped. Now the target depth was 15,000 meters at 49,000 feet. Uh, so before then, in 1979, the world record depth was held in Wachita County, Oklahoma. <laughs> what do you know? In 83, they passed 39,000 feet. Drilling was stopped for a year. They had all these um, scientists visit the site. Why would you go to a hole in the ground? And what is there to see? I don't, I don't understand. It's a drill rig. You can't, you can't see the bottom of the hole from the surface, right? I mean, maybe you can't. That would be cool if you could actually see that far. Drilling was restarted. Let's see. <laughs> Let's see. A section of the drill string twisted off and was left in the hole. Then restart for 23,000 feet. <laughs> wow. Uh, the hole reached 40,230 feet in 1989. The, uh, it was expected to reach 44,000 feet by the end of 90, and they were going to get there. However, they encountered higher than expected temperatures, 180 degrees 
Celsius instead of 100. That's kind of important for steel because at higher temperatures, steel wears faster. Right? Drilling deeper was deemed unfeasible, and the drilling was stopped in 1992. Now, why? I mean, can't they calculate how hot the Earth is and figure out how hot it's going to be at a certain depth? Why did they find that the temperature here is so much higher than what they expected? This is a prediction of hydroplate theory. You have pockets of magma trapped underneath the Earth's crust, and those places are much warmer than the rest of it. Well, if the Earth has been here for billions of years, uh, we should have basically the same temperature at any particular depth in the Earth. But we don't. And these guys just happen to hit a hot pocket. I can go into that comedy routine. I won't. Uh, all right. So uh, they would have been working at a temperature of 300 degrees Celsius. Drill bit no longer work. Coal of borehole penetrated approximately a third of the way through the continental crust, estimated in that area to be 22 miles deep. Reaching rocks of uh, really old, yeah, whatever. Um, they have lots of geophysical studies there. Baltic shield, seismic discontinuities, blah, blah, blah. One of the more fascinating things are the no transition from granite to basalt. Ho, ho, ho. Who could have predicted this? Well, we think the whole upper crust was granite beforehand, right? Hmm. So the, both below that water layer was basalt, above it, granite, according to hydroplay theory. Large quantity of hydrogen gas. Mud flowing out of the hole was boiling with. Hydrogen. Interesting. Very interesting. Where in the world am I looking? I'm looking, I'm looking for a certain thing and it's not saying anything. Alright, let's try it. Let's try this. There we go. One of the more fascinating things, okay, so change in seismic wave velocity is caused by a metamorphic transition in granite. The rock at that depth had been thoroughly fractured and was saturated with water, which was surprising. To them, it was. To me, it wasn't. Well, I wasn't around when it was found. But Wolf Brown was, and he came up with hydroplate theory before they dug this big old deep hole in the ground. And he predicted that deep in the Earth's crust, it should be heavily fractured down there, and it should be saturated with highly concentrated salt water. Well, it must have come from deep crust. Yeah, whatever. I know where it came from. It came from that water layer. And that's the beautiful thing about hydroplate theory, is um, they have no idea that it exists. So they're going out and doing all of our work for us, and we're like, well, yeah, we expected that. What, what else did we expect? Now, let's see. Oh, for heaven's sake. That's not what I'm thinking. Now this is something that was discovered more recently, that there is water on the moon. What? That's not possible, Mr. Cartwright. The moon's been there for billions of years. The moon reaches temperatures of 250 degrees Fahrenheit during the day, negative 200 degrees at night. It has no atmosphere. Any water evaporated on the surface quickly escapes in interplanetary space. Yes, 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 I know all that stuff. But if you had lots of water that was dumped on the moon very recently, like, well, 5,000 years ago may not seem like that recently, but compared to 4 billion years ago, it's quite recent. If you had lots of water dumped on the moon 5,000 years ago, then you still, should still be able to find pockets of ice at the North and South Pole on the moon in craters where the sun never actually hits. And scientists were totally surprised to find this stuff. It cannot persist at the moon's surface because water vapor is decomposed by direct energy from the sun. You think the sun is bright on the earth? Try not having an atmosphere above you when you're far looking about, you know, underneath the, uh, underneath the, underneath the sun's rays. Uh, let's see. 1960s scientists conjectured that water ice could survive in cold, permanently shadowed areas. At the moon's pulled. Yeah, 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 whatever. They didn't actually expect to find this stuff. They're trying to cover their tracks here. H2O and the chemicals in that group. Water is uh, absorbed water is calculated to consist trace, hard, concentration, okay, whatever. Like hidden down here. 
So, uh, samples returned by uh, the Soviet probe contained 0.1% by Wachard. Hmm. Free water ice at the poles was accumulated from a variety of observations, suggesting the presence of found hydrogen. And what they don't tell you is that all the designs were like, ah, poppycock. Moon's been there for billions of years. No water left. Shouldn't have been. But there was. And not just a little bit. You know, 0.1%. Yeah, get down to the poles, man. There is tons and tons of water. 600 million metric tons of water ice. Why is that such a big deal? Well, first of all, they didn't expect to find it there. I predict, I predict. Walter Brown predicted it in his theory. Turns out, we also found it on Mercury, North and South Pole and Mercury. It's even less likely to have survived on Mercury because Mercury gets up to, I don't know, 750 degrees Fahrenheit in the day. Woo, ain't it hot. And it gets pretty cold at night as well. So there's a huge temperature swing there. All of that ice should be long gone. It's been there for billions of years. 600 million metric tons. Well, this is a big deal. Scientists were, once they got over their shock, and all the young scientists who hadn't quite figured out that it shouldn't be there, they're like, wait, 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 I know. We can send a spaceship up to the moon, and then we can set up shop, get a couple of solar panels going, get some high voltage electricity, melt this stuff down, decompose it into hydrogen and oxygen. We got rocket fuel. And we can build rockets on the moon that can get anywhere because the moon has way less gravity than the Earth does. So launching rockets from the moon would be much easier to do. So we can actually land on the moon. We don't have to take all of our fuel with us. We can make more fuel on the moon. Hardcore! They got all excited about it. And that kind of drowned out all the other guys. Look, it's not supposed to be there, Bill. Shut up. You're embarrassing us. We've also found water ice on Mercury. Yeah, again, North and South Pole. Areas that the sun doesn't shine. Not supposed to be there, but it's there. And I'd be very, very interested to know if it's salt water. I would be fascinated to know that. Very much want to know. Not bad enough to go myself. <laughs> well, there may have been delivered. Oh, do you see that? Now, this is code for we have no idea what we're talking it may have been delivered to the moon over geological time scales, but the regular bombardment of water bearing comets. See, they got it backwards. They think comets bring water to the moon. Well, they do, but from the Earth originally. Comets originally came from the Earth, according to hyperplane theory. And they're forgetting that minor detail about the part that comets actually can't survive very long. Oh, they come from the Oort Club. Yeah, not really. We'll talk more about that when we get to astrophysics, all right? Well, next week we'll talk about some more predictions that hydroplane theory makes and finish up this section and we'll get started on the fossil record. And any questions over this material? Do we know how much it cost to bring that home? No, but it was a lot of money. <laughs> and, they're, and they're not even as crazy as we are now in some respects. It was probably millions of dollars. Question? So since there was like a giant millipede, whatever it's called, does that mean there might also be ginormous spiders like the ones on Harry Potter? Um, <laughs> actually, that's um, a distinct possibility. We don't have any fossil evidence of them. It's kind of hard to fossilize insects. The fossils of insects are some of the rarest fossils ever. So they're, they're big, they're very, very well could have been. You don't know for sure. I, by the way, I have never been, it's never been explained to me adequately why you must sacrifice your hearing in order to worship God. <laughs> I have never figured out why. It's more sign. Right. You want to be able to hear your grandkids talk to you, don't you? What? <laughs> uh, this, guy's, this guy's had me in class before. He knows all my tricks. You talk him well, Mr. I do my worst. Other questions? Pick up where we left off next week. See you then. Behave yourselves.